Good evening. Good evening. We are here and once again it is our great pleasure to be in your reality. So, Moon Musings number 127, that is today, it's Thursday. Storms are brewing and the skies are moving around. Uh, looks like tropical storms and hurricane types energies are, are uh, twirling in the Caribbean. Headed up the coast, perhaps North Carolina will uh, get some weather uh, this coming Labor Day weekend. But so right now everyone's cozy and safe, in the right place at the right time. And it's our intention to uh, have a good time this evening, a good class, and to guide all of you into a deeper realization of how important your thoughts are in cultivating and sculpting your own personal experience. Today uh, again is September number one, 2016. It is a new moon, a solar eclipse, as our vehicle was giving you uh, the astrological rundown for the next few weeks. And, uh, things may be quiet today, but they may be stirred up. They may continue to be stirred up in the USA and around the world with uh, contentious energies, opinions, and of course as people awaken, uh, there's new realizations to integrate and then act upon. So tonight uh, we'll open it up in a bit for questions, but we want to cover uh, some very important uh, subjects for each of you here to think about, for those out there in mystery land uh, and beyond to uh, contemplate. Our vehicle suggested that for the next week, Mercury, which is now retrograde, is lined up in the heavens in the sign of Virgo, end of Virgo, with Jupiter. So the next week can give you big expansion into the directions that you may want to go to learn to take on a new course of study perhaps in a few weeks uh, or to put some things together. Virgo rules the higher mind. It also rules service and health but let's just say that for the next week the higher mind is super available and activated in all of humanity if you so choose to go there. So take advantage of this and devote some time, especially this Labor Day weekend, to putting your feet up and giving yourself some time to think. Pull out some books perhaps, or uh, check out uh, some magazines, and perhaps you want to do a bit of research. It's an important time to come to some realizations. Then, of course, the Saturn-Neptune square on 9-10, the final one. This will have after effects for the rest of the year. And then things will move onward. And again, it will precipitate, uh, let's say, more and more confusion. So watch for the next two or three weeks uh, for people to be scratching their heads at the contradictions and the contrariness of stories, uh, one saying this, one saying that, and some systems will definitely uh, be exposed, uh, systems being Saturn uh, and of course the final square exposing uh, Neptune, some manner of uh, global fraud global deception, global illusion, Saturn being gravity, and Neptune being a fairy-like fantasy world that gravity says, oh, that's all fine for entertainment, but let's look at what's really real. 
So it could be uh, that uh, there are surprising events that are beyond anyone's control that could possibly in the USA completely change the current trend of uh, your political situations. There's turmoil afoot, is what we are getting at. Lots of turmoil. Uh, how it will play out is many, many futures to choose from. And sometimes the energies are building and pointing towards a certain direction that seems inevitable. And then something occurs, miraculously almost. Things are ameliorated. Things are switched. This is an example of switching timelines, switching probable reality. Now, as a gentle reminder, but still a very firm reminder, when you wear fear, when you invest in fear, when you think fear is normal, then you limit the timelines and the futures that you will find yourself in. And just to give you another bit of a conundrum, there are many futures to choose from and sometimes uh, people who know each other uh, may cross paths but you are in different probable worlds yet you see each other, you know each other but you are experiencing completely different situations. Why is that? Is it the luck of the draw? Is it your birth sign? Are you more together than others? We'll say that people who live in fear will attract situations that lock them down and hold them in. And so a victory always in consciousness is to recognize the, your own fear of the future, perhaps fear of what someone else may do and to look around and say am I safe in the moment and if you are then release that fear as if it was a helium balloon and you let it go releasing fear managing fear conquering fear and only allowing it to appear when you really are in danger you don't want to kick fear out of your life completely but you want it to have a place. If you have a dog, for example, and your dog is barking 24 hours a day, and the dog's got a problem and so do the neighbors and so do you. And that would be the same as if you are in fear all the time. But if you have a good dog and you say, train the dog well, and you say only back when you really want my attention or start barking really hard if I am in danger and I need to know something. The dog can then settle down. It knows its job. Its job is to be a friend to the person and to really bark it up if there is a problem. <coughs> Fear or the amygdala, which is a part of the brain complex where the amygdala, the fight or flight dwells, needs to be calmed down in everyone. There's no need to be in great fear. There is need to cultivate greater clarity of mind. Now the other issue that will help the global situation, but particularly the situation that is quite dire in the USA, is that you have become uh, a nation of liars. And it's not just the USA. Uh, everyone around the world uh, has sort of slipped quite a bit uh, in the last 50 years on their dignity, their integrity, their responsibility. And in the last 10 years or less, they have really, really slid into the sewer by behavior. We ask you, when you were in school, you were learning how to write stories. Your English teachers gave you a few instructions. They said, remember, if you are going to be a reporter, or you want to write a story, you have to do who, what, where, when, why, and how. Anyone remember that? Who, what, where, when, and why, and how. So we want you to ask yourself, 
who, what, where, when, how, and why am I lying to myself? Who am I when I lie to myself? What am I saying when I lie to myself? Where am I lying when I lie to myself? When is it that I am lying to myself? How is it that I am lying to myself? Who, what, where, when, how, why? Well, we might have skipped one then. Ask yourself this. Do you tell little fibbers? Or do you, are you comfortable with whoppers? We are not talking the burger at Burger King. <laughs> we are talking how much do you have to pretend that you are to impress others or to hide from others? This is a question we will be asking everyone because Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton seem to lie effortlessly, constantly. In Hillary's case, there's no scandal here, they say. It's just another teeny, itsy, bitsy, weeny little uh, conundrum or controversy uh, that is chipping away at her credibility as she uh, fronts the uh, Clinton Crime Corporation, as many people are calling it. Donald, he's quite comfortable with one Bordaggio after another. He's been busted on them over and over again. And then the next day denies that he even said it and blames others. Both people have issues. They are running for the president of your country. And where one side will say, the other side's lying. Each side that is supporting these people needs to stand up and say, they're both lying. Why? Is this the best we can do, liars? Now, you are being sent a message on many levels. You understand that things have been controlled for a long period of time. And even John Fitzgerald Kennedy Sr. bought his son the election back in 1960. So, voter fraud, cheating, all of this is de rigueur today. It is the way it goes. And so basically, even though people voted in primaries that were full of cheating, uh, you selected as a country two liars. You could only select two liars if people in the country were liars themselves. They lied to themselves. They lied to others as a matter of fact. See if you can, just playfully, on your own, bring this to a halt. And do your very best not to tell any little deceits, not to tell any whoppers. You know, when you live with honesty, there's no stress. And stress is what's destroying many people today. Can't think clearly because they're under so much stress. So let's start an honesty movement here. You don't have to tell anyone. You just have to live with integrity. Because there's going to be lessons down the road later on. So, that is our message for you to uh, be more responsible and to reduce the stress in your own life because you are living in very exciting times. Many things are coming together and if you can think clearly, raise your vibration and take charge of your life by using your mind, your imagination, your intentions, then uh, you can live a good life and fulfill uh, your soul's mission. And that soul's mission is to figure things out and to have love and to lead a good, meaningful life. 
and with lots of humor in it. Uh, humor is, of course, uh, part of good living. All right, so let's discuss what's going on. Let's have questions, comments, insight for Moon Musings, number one to seven. Who would like to begin, please? I have a question about crop circles. Who is it, please? Mia. Mia, all right. So just say this is in your name. So you are Mia, and you have a question about? Crop circles. Have you been in crop circles? I have never been, and there has been one lately that um, apparently is signifying pi. And there's, the theory is that it is um, people from outer space that are sending mathematical language to the Earth and how to communicate with them because the next language will be through mathematics because the, the, there will not be a language to communicate with them. And I thought, I, I've seen so many absolutely stunning crop circles and I would love to know, I have a little bit more theories about it. I have some theories of my own, but I don't know if they're close. Well, crop circles have been in proliferation since the early to mid 80s, many, many years. And uh, they are declining now in number. And of course, there are all manner of speculations as to uh, who, what, where, when, how, and why. And in any endeavor uh, that is a bit of a mystery or paranormal, you are always going to have a proliferation of disinformation. And of course, especially with today's uh, internet movement, the disinformation is fast and furious, quick. But they are real, these crop circles. They attend, uh, uh, tend to appear in a short amount of time. They, in general, over the past over 30 years, mostly appear in the southwestern region of England, uh, Salisbury Plain area to be exact, but north, south, east and west of that. And that is a highly militarized zone. And a lot of the land there is owned by the Crown, and uh, the farmers of England rent the land from the crown. So uh, the latest speculation, and then speculations have been running rampant and wild for 30 years, three decades. Our vehicle has been many times to the crop circles, and of course it's always uh, uh, exciting. It's uh, uh, mysterious and fun to troop around the English countryside. Recent uh, understanding, and this is due to uh, some video uh, capturing the actual formation of the crop circles, uh, and uh, there are a number of videos out there that are showing uh, a, a ball of light, like a drone, that uh, zooms over the field, and within seconds the crops, wheat in general, but sometimes barley, are laid down in exceptionally intricate patterns. It has long been speculated that beings from outer space, so to speak, are behind the delivery of these circles. Uh, about 10, 15 years ago, there was speculation that the super secretive agency called NSA, National Security Agency, was also behind some of these circles. Let's just say that uh, conjecture is, it's uh, long been uh, mathematically uh, delivered. Let's say that uh, 20 years ago various uh, fractal sets were delivered. So pi today is not anything new. Uh, the mathematical language and the message in math and the precision of math has been the long-standing uh, 
characteristic of these crop circles. And uh, they point to moon phases, things happening in the heavens, etc. Uh, some of the conjecture is, is that it is uh, extraterrestrials in space uh, delivering plans, blueprints, maps to Earth. And being uh, that humans are not clever enough to sort these things out, and being that large majority of these circles appear next to military installations, and being that the military are constantly doing uh, helicopter flyovers over these circles, and then um, farmers plow them down rather quickly, there's speculation. Uh, that extraterrestrials are working with various Earth-based military forces and their own forces uh, within Earth-based military organizations to send plans as to how to build certain structures that then will be uh, built on Earth because you have the structures to build things and then shipped into space. Gives you something to think about, Mia. We will say this, that uh, some crop circles have high degrees of radiation. Uh, some people have gotten sick in some crop circles. Uh, there have been fake crop circles. Uh, there used to be guys named Doug and Dave that would go out and uh, with boards at night push things down. But the intricacy of some of these circles are beyond astounding. And of course, this would only bode that an advanced type of intelligence would be laying these down. And they are not doing it just uh, to uh, spook you in the night or to pull your chain. There's a method, there's a language and it is as if it's been a Morse code that comes from heaven to earth and for those on earth, let's say, to uh, read the instructions. Hmm. Who else has a question? Anthony. Anthony, welcome. Hi, would you speak on alternate timelines and deja vu? As you're speaking about crop circles, I've heard this conversation before, but not here. I was in my garage listening to the peas talk about it. And it's the same words. And I wasn't here. Well, your consciousness is vast for every person. And today's world, with all the diversions and the devices of which we are not fans, uh, is robbing your consciousness of deeper exploration. Consciousness can be located in many places. You can bilocate, trilocate. Uh, this is a normal state of affairs. We'll say the creatures in the natural world, be they insects, uh, termites, uh, foxes, uh, possums, squirrels, uh, dinosaurs of old horses, uh, you name it, the animals, the, the creatures, birds, the insects. They have a non-locality within their own consciousness. Humankind has this non-locality, uh, meaning that you can be in many places at once, your consciousness can. And yet most people have have pushed this ability far back into the recesses of mind. So if you've had this uh, deja vu moment, uh, it is an example of how consciousness can roam while it's awake, while it's asleep, be focused one place, doing a task perhaps, and yet be tuned in someplace else. You can call it alternative timelines, but it's more a roaming ability of consciousness. And you tend, when you are doing some sort of repetitive work, 
uh, something you're very familiar with, you've done it before over and over again, for example, women knitting or doing embroidery or crocheting, you think they're just sitting there doing nothing? When the hands are occupied in, in rote, repetitive manner, it creates a sort of a neural stability, this motor skill. Uh, this is, and then the mind can roam and expand and, and, and travel the multiverse. So that's a, a way things can work. Anything else, Anthony? No, thank you. What is your sun sign, please? Sagittarius. Sagittarius, all right. And Mia, what is your sun sign? Pisces. What is it? Pisces. Pisces, all right. So for the rest of the night, when you say hello to us, please just say this is so and so and give us your astro. It's a little bit uh, expansive so that you understand uh, uh, how each other deals with things. Pisces is the dreamer. Uh, Sagittarius likes a sport. It's expansive. It, it likes to party and have a good time. Uh, usually Pisces is an artist of some sort. All right, who else has a question? My name is Karina. Karina, yes, welcome. And you are? I am Scorpio Sun uh, and Aquarius Moon and Western. Uh, it's Scorpio and Eastern. Jotish, it's a... Uh, well, let's stick with Aquarius. Western. So you are Scorpio. Yeah. All right, so that is an intense sign, mm -hmm. and you are fortunate now because Mars has left your sign uh, just a few weeks, or actually end of July. So uh, things are better for you, yes? Yes. Good. It's a month of uh, uh, August, things probably loosened up a bit, and you've got some energy to move forward. Yes. So what's your question? Well, you mentioned about Jupiter being in an expanded place and, and that being around relationships. Or Jupiter moves into the sign of Libra. Libra is the sign of relationships. And Jupiter, when it moves into relationships, uh, on a downside, it could blow it all up if your relationship's very wobbly. But in general, uh, Jupiter in Libra, relationship-wise, can open up uh, a partnership, uh, greater fairness, uh, 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 find love, find compatibility, but also let us add Jupiter in Libra on the mundane worldwide level could blow up enemies. In other words, enemies start coming out and fighting each other, but that's another story. What's your question? Corina. In, um, I've been dealing with relationships lately, but my question for the group was, is, um, what is the the ultimate or the, the purpose for intimate loving relationships? Um, what is the purpose of it? Yeah, I mean, are they, are they to heal our old stuff, or what's the ultimate purpose that they can be, and how can we tell the difference between reason, season, or lifetime when they do come? What's that last part? How, how can, can you tell? tell if it's a reason, a season, or a lifetime, as they say. In, in a relationship? Yes. How, do, how can we tell when a partner comes to us, uh, some come to seem like they've hurt, but they actually show us areas where we need to love ourselves. But the ultimate purpose of a relationship would be what, in your opinion, in, in an intimate relationship? And how can we tell when it's a reason? a season or a lifetime partnership? All right. And this is a very good question, mm -hmm. considering where the energies will be moving and everyone is going to look at relationship. Number one, <clears throat> why do people get involved in relationship? To learn. Imagine you are born and you live to be a hundred. You never had any matter of intimate relationship. What would you do? Who would you hug? Who would you kiss? A teddy bear? There's comfort in relationship. There's mirroring. There's reliability. There's love. These are the upsides. And most important, whether it is partnership in business 
or partnership in life in terms of life partner or love, however you want to say it, sex partner. Trust must be the absolute given. You cannot have relationship without trust. This also goes back to the political season of, of your world today. How can you as a nation move forward without trusting the people you are putting in charge? You can't. So it's the same thing in relationship. Do you have trust? Do you offer trustworthiness on your part? Are you trustworthy? And if your partner can trust you to be and who you say you are, does the partner offer the same thing back? And if not, why is one person saying, I will be trustworthy, and the other one says, well, I don't have to be. So, that is the utmost of importance. When you are looking for relationship, <clears throat> of course, you are going to cross the path of those you have loved before and those you've loved before and have unfinished business with. A hundred years ago, let's take it to uh, 1916. You're in the middle of World War I the war to end all wars. Massive war. Stress. Confusion. Manipulation. A modern war where there were armaments and, and very devious and destructive ways uh, to entice men to go out and kill one another. And women put on their nursing outfits and went, uh, and went and stood on the battlefield in the tents. And watched one destroyed body after another of young boys be carried off the battlefield. When people married, beginning of the 20th century, they married who came along. Perhaps it was the person down the street, around the corner, family friend. Perhaps for those immigrants who left Europe and other places came to uh, uh, USA. They got settled in their villages. They met someone there. And they struggled, of course, but the choices were very minimal. And the pressure was great. You could not be single people. 100 years ago. You couldn't say I'm going out to the bars and party. Or, hey, hey, mom and dad, I need a 50 tonight. Can I have the car? I know I smashed it up two months ago, I'm sorry. A completely different world. People stuck together. And they tended then to have a small radius of, of territory and yet they attracted to themselves, psychically now, pheromone-wise, who it is that they needed to work it out with, and they worked it out. Do not think the stresses were not there. There's always stress in relationship because you don't change necessarily together. So relationships reason, season, or whatever, depends upon where you are in terms of time and culture. Today, you can live together, you can mix your sexes, you can do whatever you want, pretty much. You can have a hundred partners if you want to. So many people have sexual diseases, it's just another thing that goes with the territory. But the bottom line is this, what do you want out of a relationship? What are you looking for? And today most people want a meal right now. They are not thinking ahead. A hundred years ago people settled in. They had vision. It was not any easier than it is today to get an automobile, 
to set up your own place, people were more willing to do it. There's a restlessness today, a dissatisfaction among people today that nothing's good enough, no one's quite perfect enough. And as we mentioned earlier, Corina, there is this big tendency among people to be dishonest. That's why you have Hillary and the trumpet. Ask us a question based on what we have just said, please. When, let's say for example, two people um, get together and one person is wanting that trust, but in this day and age, there's no right to ask for exclusivity or something like that. There is a right to ask for exclusivity if that's what you want. Mm -hmm. And the other person has the right to tell the truth and say, I, I can't offer exclusivity. And then the person who wants exclusivity says, that's all I'm available for. And then it's in the field. What you are, who you are, is in your energy field. And if you want an exclusive, loving, trusting relationship, Monogamy. Remember, it's pretty difficult in today's world to get people to be monogamous. Why? Because there's so many choices, so many diversions, so many bars and clubs uh, and, and internet and dating apps. And uh, this is the breakdown of relationship. They have classes and annulments now that are taught by priests. Yes. Just in case your marriage didn't work, here's what you need to know if you want the annulment. Well, 50 years ago, you, they didn't even want to, the Catholic Church didn't even want to hear the word annulment. So times change. But if you know what you want, then you have to hold out for it. And if you don't get it, that's all right. Are you the kind of person that's going to settle for less? <coughs> And if you are, is that... You'll never be happy. The old, the old childhood stuff, when you realize, okay, so I felt this when I was little, am I doing this again? Can people just recreate that same old pain? And yes, so, yes. take responsibility and dissolve that or heal that in ourselves? Well, first of all... So we can change that, that pattern. A hundred years ago, there were many less people on the planet. And there was, uh, let's say, tension and fear and a lot of ignorance about how and why things work. So there was a greater inclination to marry and bond, to work together, to have someone that you could count on. It, it simply was, had been going on for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. All that got blown open in the 1960s when the planet Pluto and Uranus made a conjunction, in other words they were together in the sign of Virgo, and it split open the generations, it split open the culture, uh, as you know the rise of, of uh, people's rights, women's rights, whatever, and uh, today you are in the outpicturing of that. and. People have all manner of freedom not to commit. This does create a big problem because, uh, again, it comes back to the individual. As a woman, we ask this of all women, do you want five children with five husbands? Is that what you are available for? Is that what you want to offer your children? Five men? making a family, there's no future. Stability, even though it's very difficult to engage in, uh, loyalty, stability, honesty, and relationship, it is that that builds strong families. It is that that gives children, uh, let's say, an understanding of how things work. So, you will create patterns that you grew up with. When you are a child, Karina, 
It goes for all people. You look at your mother and father and you choose your mother and father, remember. You qualify and you choose the family that you are a part of. You qualify for them, you choose them for your own reasons. Uh, sometimes they have the DNA you want, sometimes the mother and father are going to act in a way that is familiar to your soul and that you want to be around it for good or not good. So what you see when you are children, how mom acts, how dad acts, uh, you absorb it, you are programmed by it. Your mom and dad are your first programmers. And before TV, there was a lot more stability. TV showed up in the 50s and it was pretty calm in the 50s by the 80s and 90s and oh, it's raj. So people watch everything they see, they can form opinions about it. So when you are young, you're watching mom and dad operate. And you've heard it all before, monkey see, monkey do, uh, mimicking, etc. Uh, kids start swearing really young because they hear mom say damn or something like this. At first it's cute, but you recognize that children are little mimickers. And then as you grow up, you spend the rest of your life figuring out what you formed opinions of when you were little. Yet the things you formed opinions of are exactly what your soul needed and incarnated for to recognize, take on, find the efficacy or efficiency of it, whether it works or not, and then make some clear decisions. The advantage in this lifetime is that you have the opportunity to clear up a lot of stuff to get really clear and to live a good life because you have so much information available to you. Which because there's so much information and so many choices, people keep making poor choices, telling lies, and thinking they are kids in a candy shop when it comes to relationships and sex. Understand everything you set into motion. It's not just for this lifetime. You're programming your kids, and your soul will deal with it from other lifetimes. So, the trick, Karina, is when you catch yourself in the same old pattern and it's not working, rather than blame the partners that you may be playing this out with, in your case it would be men, yes? Mm -hmm. yes. So rather than saying, look at this Joe Schmo, he's a jerk. Uh, uh, look at this guy Dick here, he's another jerk. And this guy Robert, he ends up being another jerk. How do I end up uh, these jerks? And then you say to yourself, what is it in me that is broadcasting a signal that's, that in the ether, in, 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 the, in the telepathic realm, that says what I'm available for. You attract the people magically to yourself that are responding to what your expectations are in relationship. Raise your expectations or change them or go back to what mom and dad did and say, mom, dad, wow, I picked this up from you. I mimicked, I modeled, I neared, it's a disaster. Thank you so much for being my parents. Thank you so much for showing me all the things that did work and for the things that did not work. I graciously accept my own new level of intelligence and I release these patterns, I am not available for them anymore. That's a way you can work yourself through it. Does that make sense yes, to you? Yes, it does. Relationships are where things hit home. Children, of course, really 
really hit it for you. But uh, you're not supposed to have sex with kids. That is called pedophilia, and it ruins the children's lives and your lives and ruins society. It is your partners, your adult partners, where you have sex, and it is sex, as it's called in the Bible, knowing someone. He knew her, she knew him. This knowing is actually the most apt description of sex because once you get uh, uh, these sexual organs, your genitals rubbing up against each other, penetrating one another and playing with each other, bringing each other to uh, joys and, and, and to pregnancies and orgasms and all these things, woo, do you open up Pandora's box. Sex is the ultimate of joy. It gives you bonding, trust, healing, helps you create family and life, but it also stirs up all the scorpionic, dark, heavy stuff. Because once you have sex with someone, it becomes very deeply, deeply intense. This is what Scorpio, the sign Scorpio, uh, rules, the intensity of, of relationship in sexuality. And uh, there's no escaping it. All people feel it, uh, but many ignore it uh, or they, uh, uh, they just go numb. In today's world, there, you have big problems with sexuality. Men, as we've mentioned many times, are having erectile uh, problems in their 20s. And women uh, are frigid, they can't get pregnant, uh, they've lost any interest in sexuality. Uh, this is uh, not good. Sexuality and a true loving expression with sexuality is one of the highlights of being human and living on Earth. The animals enjoy sexuality as well, you know. It's not quite as complicated for them, though. What else, Corina? Thank you so much. Um, when we feel those childhood pains, for example, um, when I was a young child, I was always begging to go into my sister's room and spend the night with her. And she would always say, um, she would kick me out or do something very demeaning or, you know, I was sort of a, like a programming. So when I go into a relationship and I see, oh gosh, that's happening again, but now as I'm an adult, I can go back and say, that's when I felt that before. So I'm thanking the person for, okay, so I'm getting to see this again. What do I do in that moment? Do I go back to the old feeling to acknowledge and raise that own inner child? Or do I simply get really clear on my intentions and just say, I'm no longer available for that. Well, you, you want to be clear about what you are and are not available for, but if your sister kicked you out of her room, we take it she was your bigger sister. Yes. Uh, there's hardly a family that does not have that story. I know. Just understand, yes. put yourself in your sister's shoes. She doesn't want to be bothered with a snot-nosed, whining <laughs> little sister who adores her. Right. Right. Because you want to be her, she's bigger than you, but she's looking at you as a pescaroo. Right. That's normal. Unless, unless she tied you up in the garage and set you on fire or something, then that's psychopathic. <laughs> but to kick you out of her room and to want to be not affiliated with you, even if you are uh, only nine months younger, this is the stage of growing up. You never want to be a baby. Do you understand? You don't want to hang out with babies right. to a certain age. So that is not a good idea to take that rejection to this day. You ought to be laughing about that and recognizing that as normal behavior. If that wounded you very deeply back then, of her kicking you out of the room, then you have to ask yourself, not about her, why after all these years would I remember that and be so wounded and then turn everything else into it? Where from other lifetimes do I have this wound where as soon as I'm not wanted I blow it up out of proportion. Mm -hmm. 
You follow? Yes. Then what's the answer? You think about it. All right. Uh, it's, it could be a carryover from another lifetime, a pattern, because I feel this way, and your feelings are legitimate. They're always legitimate, but they may not be in complete understanding of the situation. This is where past life regression can be very good. You find a good regression therapist, and or you talk to the field of existence, your guide, your higher self, and you say, I want to get to the bottom of my feeling of rejection and how I remember it with my sister, and now I'm not sure in relationships, I, I'm not sure when I am and when I'm not, and do I, am I too needy, do I want to be overly assured, etc., etc. I want to get to the root of this. And I ask for some signs. That's all you have to do. Okay. You take responsibility for it. Then someone may say to you, Karina, have you read this book? Oh, it's one of these uh, uh, passionate beach novels here. But uh, go ahead, take it, sit in the sun. You read it and it's all about the exact issues that you have. Hmm. But it's cast in Spain. You say, well, this is even more bizarre, because for my whole life I've always wanted to go to Spain. I have this thing, Spain. You see how it works? Right. And you start to unravel. And you act as if the issue, the timeline, the higher self, and this self can and want to resolve this to bring you into wholeness and peace of mind. That is part of the work of awareness, to find the reasons why you are all wounded, why you are stuck, and to give you benefit of the doubt. Remember that you are using 5% of your DNA and 5% at best of your cranial capacity. So this puts a bit of a strain on the self in the easy ability to remember other timelines. But if you look at the chart over here, you see the pea, carrot, onion, potato for the garden of the mind. Uh, in the onion, the theta state is where your memories are stored in the body, in the cells, in the bones, everywhere. You could also, if you wanted to make an intention to put all this together and go to a spa and have a massage and say, it's my intention that when I have this massage, um, as I'm relaxing, the picture of other lifetimes come to me. It's work and it may take a while, years, to get the picture. But once you decide to do something, your word is good and it will be done. That's how things unfold. Does that help you? Very much so, thank you. That's what we wanted to hear. Uh, good, we will listen for greater clarity from you, Corina, and we will, uh, if you like, give you a helping hand on this. Absolutely, please do. All right, good. Be aware that some little synchros or uh, some unravelings, uh, some clues may come to you and in the meantime set your standard very high. Uh, not that so you are unattainable, just be gracious and be a bit more unavailable. You are a beautiful woman, you have beautiful energies, uh, there's no need to lower your standard. Thank you so much. All right? Yes, thank you. Uh, and your children deserve uh, uh, the best as well. All right, who has a question? Uh, Peace, this is Dorsey. Dorsey, what a good booming voice you have well, here. Well, thank you. How's uh, business going this summer? Uh, it's been sort of crazy and busy, but... Uh, yes, because it's so hot and so Right, and I had to take a little break and get my body back in, in shape. <laughs> yes, you need to put your feet up this weekend in particular and uh, just hang out with the birds and squirrels. Oh, okay. They have a lot to tell you. Oh, yeah? <laughs> I was in nature today listening for him. All right, good. But, uh, but my question is, over, I know someone that just got back from Germany, and I know there are a lot of the immigrants are in different places. You are talking about the Middle Eastern, Northern African right. immigrants in Germany. Right. So what's the on-the-scene scoop? On-the-scene scoop, just got back from there. Uh, they're wreaking havoc on the residents, 
businesses, they're telling, going into businesses telling that if you don't quit serving pork, we will burn the place down. Uh, they are raping young women by the thousands and the police aren't doing anything about it. Um, this, yes, this has been out and this raping uh, has been a buzz now since uh, we believe the new year is a uh, big cover up on it, but please continue. Right, and the people are scared and the police aren't doing anything. And I feel like, I don't know why, I just feel like, I know it's that's the plan that's for the United States also. But um, I just didn't know if you just give us some insight on that and what direction is that heading to? Well, it's interesting that Germany has a, a high standard of living and uh, it has a very strong uh, GDP and uh, people uh, in general are very uh, talented, hardworking, uh, affluent. And to have over uh, a million uh, migrants, immigrants from uh, Middle East, Northern Africa move in uh, has been rather destabilizing. And uh, the premier there, Merkel, has uh, sort of used this to say, look, we are uh, doing a big kumbaya here. We want to be so compassionate. But uh, that, again, is more double talk because the system uh, any country uh, will have difficulty integrating a, a million, a million homeless people and making, in a very short amount of time, systems for a million people. It's difficult enough to take 50 or 100,000 in, do you follow, and to resettle them. So uh, underneath there is, uh, let's say, a plan for destabilization. And no one in Europe is happy with the situation. Uh, and again, when you are talking about uh, a, a, a Muslim culture uh, and transplanting it into a Western culture, uh, the Germans are free with their bodies. They have, like the French, they like to topless sunbathe. Uh, have their affairs, etc. Uh, they consider this to be very sophisticated. And like the French, the French think it is simply uh, what is called peche mignon, a little nothing uh, to have an affair. Well, cheating is, is quite, uh, quite common in these cultures. And it's all done uh, with a, a wink and a nod and this kind of thing. So to have uh, this forced uh, energy come in, and remember Muslim men are not used to seeing women's bodies exposed or women uh, expressing certain ideas and freedoms. And of course, uh, uh, this is cultures clashing, and beliefs clashing, and there's more to it than that. Uh, because these men, especially on the sexual violation, could easily be put in place. There's, uh, again, as you said, uh, a plan to disrupt the stability of various cultures. And uh, certainly people in the Middle East and Northern Africa uh, their destabilizing began with what's called the Arab Spring, 2011. And there's evidence that uh, different <coughs> governmental teams went in to various places in Northern Africa mm -hmm. and the Middle East to create, to stir up and act as agents provocateur to destabilize uh, political situations and to create all of this unrest. One could say that uh, it looks as if certain countries are targeted, but they were practice for what's coming in other places. There's global unrest and it's growing more and more. And this is why it's important for more people to wake up to set a standard and to work together, to raise the vibration, but to also work in cooperation with one another. 
because of the forces that are out there, governments, extraterrestrials, and others, want to do their best uh, to create lack of trust uh, and uh, to separate people by gender, by race, by culture, uh, you name it. And uh, most people don't want this. As we said, they want to have good relationships and to have stability. What else do you want to know, Dorsey? Oh, that's good for right now. Thank you. All right. Who else has a question? This is Virgil. Virgil, loud and clear. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, they say you are what you think. <laughs> that becomes the outcome. What about animals? Some are wild, some are not, some are tame. How about even plants? Like Cleve Baxter, he said his plants could pick up on his thoughts. Can they think? They can sense. You are confusing consciousness with thinking. Consciousness senses and perceives. So a plant, for example, um, can open its flowers and it senses when there are hummingbirds or butterflies uh, in the area and it may get even vibrating in its blooms to send out a message to the butterflies in the next yard or, or the uh, hummingbirds further away to come over and get some nectar. Is that thinking? Not really. Is it instinct? Not really. It's consciousness. The awareness of an environment and of self and the desire, let us say, to interact with the environment. So one could say that rather than thinking, creatures have desire innate desire to create fulfillment. So for when the hibiscus, which only gives one blossom, it opens in the morning and by the next morning it's closed and it's deceased. But for that 24 hour period, that flower lives a whole life. The pistil and the stamen are vibrating and that flower wants to fulfill its whole life, its blossoming, its opening, and be the best it can be. This is nature. Within the scheme of nature, you are thinking beings. But dogs think, and many animals think, not all creatures, but they have a reasoning and you are learning over the last number of decades as more animal and plant oriented people work with animals and plants they are astounded at the intelligence that both animals and plants demonstrate in response to human interaction anything else Virgil who else That's has a question? Who has a question? Michael. Michael, welcome. Oh, I'm Leo. You asked for that earlier. Who is, uh, you are a Leo? All right. Uh, this kind of goes back to the, the discussion on the crop circles and the communication through them. Uh, so many of them incorporate sacred geometry. And I'm curious if, if you have any input on how we might benefit from the use of sacred geometry in our spaces and in the design of our spaces, etc. Well, it is called sacred geometry, but it is actually um, precision in design and numbers. And the word sacred has come in because when this precision whether it is working with pi, uh, working with the golden mean, 
these numbers and these relationships tend to create structures of beauty and structures that have uh, longevity. They last for a long, long time. And this is why uh, the word sacred has been applied because uh, someone can just say, well, let's get a two by four here and bang this together here and there. But if someone does uh, 1.618, etc., and uses the golden mean, uh, there will be mimicking of the body's form of golden mean and structures built in this relationship uh, tend to have balance uh, and uh, again uh, structural beauty. So how to benefit from it? Uh, let's just say this, the mathematics that most people are taught has nothing to do with sacredness. It has to do with being a worker so that you can then be sent out into the field and have some sort of education and be productive. Today people are fighting over this uh, common core education uh, that many say allows everyone to be at the same level of dumb. <laughs> And it used to be if you weren't that great in math, well, you weren't that great in math. And those who were went on ahead and those who weren't did something else. Today, everyone wins an award. Everyone's neutral. Everyone's just, no one can stand out. No one can be better. No one can excel. It'll make other people feel bad. So you must all get a common core, uh, just no numbers so that you can go to work. It's rebellions against this everywhere because you don't learn anything. In actuality there needs to be a return to the understanding of math uh, as a, a purpose, as how the balance of life can open keys to understanding. And there's the other end of numbers too, uh, numerology. The mixing of numbers has meaning and it applies uh, esoteric type of, of understanding of reality. So any course of study uh, that would enhance this kind of uh, exploration of mathematics would be advised. Uh, even to get coloring books, adult coloring books, where you are coloring in various shapes and sizes that are uh, replicas of fractals, golden mean, uh, pi, uh, anything like this, would be very advantageous to the brain and its development. Uh, mathematics is, along with music, a form of language. A language that transcends, let's just say, a, a certain type of colloquial communication. Uh, and it is a language that uh, visiting extraterrestrials have long used. And they have taught humans, particularly the visiting Anunnaki. Anunnaki referring to those who from heaven to earth came. Uh, they uh, are the progenitors uh, of mathematics on your planet. They, uh, especially uh, Hermes, Thoth, Ningish, Zadar, all one character, um, is the mathematical genius. And so anything you can find out from Hermes, that is the Greek word, Thoth, that is Egyptian, and Ningish Zida or Ningish Zida, that is the Anunnaki name. All three names refer to one individual, an individual who basically has set up the mathematical formulation of the planet, worked with Pythagoras, all manner of beings through telepathy, and to this day is part and parcel of the crop circle program. We like when we get those 
heaps now and again. Uh, they come through uh, quite cutely on the uh, CD, and it is uh, a revelation of the consciousness uh, when you discover something. You all do it. Hmm. Yes. What does that hmm mean? Hmm. I didn't know that. Wow, I just realized something. That's good. So, uh, Michael, does that help you a bit? Yes, thank you. Are you a builder? Yes. You may want to build something, even small, with the golden mean. There's the beep. Uh, and use that ratio. It can be quite fascinating to start to build. First, you may do it on paper. You can accomplish a lot with a compass, a pen, a ruler, some colored pens or magic markers, whatever you want. When you work in this capacity, you stimulate the neural networks. And as you stimulate your neural networks, you cannot help but get smarter. Your society will say to you, oh, as you age, you get dumber and dumber. The people who get dumber and dumber are the ones who sit in front of screens all the time. And then they think the world is flat. And then guess what it is if you sit in front of a screen? It is a flat world. Yes, we've had fools come here and ask us uh, from the internet, is the world really flat? It is a sign and symptom of uh, screen mentality. But nonetheless, everything has shape and, and form to it. And it's wanting to be, to be understood, so play with it. Your creativity uh, can grow and grow, and you do, as a people, uh, get smarter with age if you cultivate it. All right, beep a beep, it means we have about five minutes or so. Who has a question? I have one more. And who is it? Mia. Again. Mia, loud and clear. You are getting a little quiet there. I don't want to ask political questions, but we were starting the evening out about all the lying, and so I wanted to know if you had any thoughts about Jill Stein. Not enough oomph to get it done. Mm -hmm. She is the Green Party, yes? Yes. Not enough oomphy to get it done. There's worldwide revolution taking place and people are all around the world questioning the integrity of their political leaders. And this is right on course with where the energy is today. So, uh, one more question. Well, Pease, this is Dorsey. Yes, Dorsey. Yes, you, you, you brought up something a while ago about coloring. And I remember on one of your CDs you mentioned about mandalas. Little mandalas, little, mandalas, yes. whatever. Mandalas. And now I see they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go to truck stops, bookstores, they're everywhere. And I remember, hearing, I remember you mentioned on your CDs, so I figured there has to be a meaning behind it for them just to be popping up everywhere. You, you mean just there just they the are? the coloring books, they're, they're everywhere. Oh, the coloring books. The man, yeah. Now, a mandala is uh, an intricate piece of art and many of them have uh, what would be called the sacred mathematical principles and it has been long known in the eastern hemisphere that uh, monks and other practitioners of isolation and expansion of consciousness would be encouraged to stare at a mandala uh, or to meditate or do something like this, what would be the point? The point would be that after you would look at it for a long, long time, first the mind would be bored and it would drift all over the place and it would go here, there, or, or the person would fall asleep or start snoring or, or forget. But after a while, staring at the mandala, it would start to come alive and it would help to focus the mind away from chatter, from inner talk, from drifting, from trivialities, and the mind would start to focus and get clearer and clearer and clearer. And sometimes the head monks would uh, test the, uh, the, the younger monks, they would say, you stare at this mandala now 20 years, what do you get? Nothing. <laughs> stare 20 more. 
<laughs> then they would say very few words, you know, in some of these monasteries. And they check back later. You stare at what you see. And the answer comes. I leave the body. And I see from above the monastery. Head monk says, good work. Because once you start to open the mind, it takes discipline. But you can enhance your perceptions and claim that which is quite natural, this non-locality. The, first there's focus, and then that focus allows one to travel the multiverse. So these coloring, uh, coloring books of mandalas, they are an exercise in focusing the mind, relaxing the mind, de-stressing the mind, and making something a beauty. Beauty tends to open your psychic senses. Another form of mandala, and we will end with this, is in Europe, there was, uh, in other places around the world, to India for certain parts of China long ago, there would be the mandala on earth, that the garden would be laid out over acres and acres with a precision, just like a mandala. And yet, the gardener 400 years ago would lay something out, picture perfect from the air, and everyone else would marvel over how this could possibly be. If you climbed up the top of the hill, you could see how it was. It was because these master gardeners also knew how to bilocate, look from up above, lay out the garden in their mind from above, and then come down and plant it. A victory, of course, in consciousness. Something that... Uh, we bid all of you to aim for, whether it is in relationship, whether it is in receiving ideas, uh, bringing greater uh, love to your life, uh, more important work, uh, greater financial uh, uh, reassurances, or health and vitality. Victories. That's what we ask you to aim for. Victories beyond what appears to be possible. But remember, consciousness has a lot of power. And your body responds eagerly to your expansion of consciousness. And for that you have our cheers and our support. So for this evening we bid you to create the best pleasant journeys and we will see you uh, soon again at the moon. Good evening.